Oh man, it's good to be together. If you have your Bible, you can open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is where we will be together this morning. In a moment, we'll begin in verse 12 once we get to reading it. Um, but as you're turning there, you know, many of you know that I really enjoy history. Right? I mean, I just love uh, learning about it and, and, and all of that. I mean, that was really the whole premise of this Return and Reflect series that we've just gone through uh, this past month. It's this idea that in order to move forward, in order to, to head uh, toward what's to come, we need to look back on where we've been, right? History has so much to teach us. We have so much to learn from it. And as we know, today is a historic day in our nation, in our country. Uh, it's a day that we often celebrate freedom. And so I'm going to talk about freedom today. Now, I, I was a little torn as I was thinking about this because I really wasn't sure whether to just get up and sort of acknowledge, hey, it's a holiday, and then move on with some kind of normal sermon, uh, or to hone in on some of the themes that are, are present in this day. But the more that I thought about it and this theme of freedom, the more I thought there, there is something here for us to grasp. There's something important here for us to reflect on. And so that's what I want to do together this morning. Something that I've been reflecting on a lot this year is that this year in particular offers us uh, some unique history about freedom and, and an interesting perspective on freedom. Because although today is a national holiday, about two weeks ago, there was another holiday recognized nationally for the first time, a holiday called Juneteenth. Now, have any of you m maybe just recently learned about Juneteenth? I know several people who kind of, it's like, whoa, what's this? This is a new thing. I, I grew up knowing about Juneteenth and learning about it really for two reasons. One, it, its origins are in the state of Texas, and I grew up in Texas, so it was just normal there. We, we knew about Juneteenth. We knew about that day. But another reason is that it happens to be the same day as my birthday. Uh, and so I, I've just always remembered this, this day. I, as a kid, I, I never um, liked, I was always shy to tell people when my birthday was. And so if they asked, I would just say, oh, it's Juneteenth. And if they didn't know when that was, then too bad for them. Um, but, but Juneteenth is this really important day. And it is also a day that's about freedom. And I think by holding together the history of July 4th and the history of Juneteenth, we begin to see something about what freedom is. We get to see a better picture of freedom and its trueness. You see, on July 4th, 1776, representatives from the 13 colonies ratified these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right? July 4th, 1776, they declared this and, and signed it. But it wasn't until June 19th, 1865, almost 100 years later, that General Order Number 3 was proclaimed in Texas and informed the people there that all slaves are free. And it goes on to say this involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. You see, by, by holding these days together, we see a larger picture of what freedom is, how it works, and ultimately what it's for. You see, freedom requires moments of declaration. It requires moments of proclamation. But those big moments do not define freedom nearly as much as the many small moments 
that follow them. Anyone familiar with history is going to know that 1865 was by no means the fullness of freedom in this country. Right? It was another hundred years after that that we hear Martin Luther King Jr. dreaming of a day that freedom will ring across this land. Right? And so freedom comes in these waves. Freedom comes one wave after another uh, through process. It's progressive. And this is what I want to reflect on today this truth about freedom. And we're going to see it in our passage. So let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Since then, we have such a hope. We act with great boldness, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed." Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for the gift of this day. And we do thank you for the place where we live and the opportunities that we have in it. I pray this morning as we consider freedom and we consider the words of your text that you would sharpen our minds and soften our hearts, that we might know you and love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So verses 17 and 18 of what we've just read really sum everything up, right? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And it goes on to say, we are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. You see, there is freedom, but this freedom is not once and done. It is something that continues to unfold, that continues to progress from one degree of glory to another. And then verses 12 through 16 also illustrate this same truth. Uh, in these verses, and go really going back to the beginning of chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, Paul references a story from Exodus chapter 34. And the book of Exodus is all about freedom. Uh, the book opens with God's people suffering under the oppression of Pharaoh. And it goes on to tell the story of Israel's freedom from Egypt. And just with one incredible sign after another, God delivers the people from Egypt. And then in Exodus chapters 12 and 13, the people finally pack up and go. They head out of Egypt, and, and then they're free, right? Well, just keep reading, right? In chapter 4, they come right up to the Red Sea. What are they going to do, right? There's this big obstacle in front of them, but you know the story, God once again acts miraculously, and he parts the sea, and the people are able to cross over it on dry ground. And so now they're free, right? Well, yes. In chapter 15 of Exodus, there's this huge celebration. Moses sings a song about it. And in Exodus 15, verse 13, he sings to God, In your steadfast love, you led the people whom you redeemed. 
That word redeemed is a, is a huge word. I mean, we use it all the time. It's, it's a freedom word. The word redemption refers to the setting free of captive people. When people are set free, they are redeemed. And so he gives thanks to God who has redeemed his people, who has set them free. And then along with Moses, Miriam, and the women also sing and dance in celebration, saying, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Right? So, so in, this, in Exodus 15, they're singing and they're celebrating because now they're free, right? Well, yes, but the story goes on. In chapter 19 of Exodus, the people arrive and settle at the base of Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up to meet with God. And while he's up there, the people become a little restless. They become a little impatient. And by chapter 32, instead of dancing to the glory of God, they begin dancing around a golden calf. Right? Because though the people have been freed from Egypt, they're not free yet. They're not free from idolatry. They're not free from sin. And so when Moses sees this, he is furious with the people. Uh, he's received the Ten Commandments on these tablets, and he throws them to the ground and breaks them. He's so angry. But ultimately, he intercedes for them, and God shows them mercy. And it's at this point, Exodus 34, where Moses goes back up the mountain. He's interceding on the people's behalf, and God shows them mercy, and God renews his covenant with them. He's given those tablets once more. God does not give up on his people, but he shows them mercy. And when Moses comes down this time, his face is glowing. It says his face is shining, reflecting the glory of God. And the people are afraid, so he puts this veil over it, right? And this is what Paul is referring to in the passage we've just read in 2 Corinthians. This veil, the shining face in this veil is a sign of God's people who, who continue to need freedom. It's a sign of their continuing need for freedom, but also a sign of God's mercy on them to deliver them. And this pattern continues throughout Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. I mean, we could just keep going. The rest of the Old Testament, this pattern continues, right? Just from that point, from the foot of Mount Sinai, they head off and they set off through the wilderness. But time and again, the people doubt God. They want to go back to Egypt. They keep saying, let's just go back there. And even when they arrive at the edge of the promised land and look into it, they turn back around and they're like, I'm too afraid to go in there, right? And so I, I've, I've heard this whole process throughout the book of Exodus and Numbers and so on summed up, summed in the effect of this. After you take the people out of Egypt, you still need to get the Egypt out of the people Amen. because they're stuck, right? They are not free yet. This is how it is with freedom. It doesn't come all at once, but step by step, from one degree of glory to the next. Now, why does this matter, right? What does this mean to us? I mean, in some ways, this could kind of just feel really hopeless, right? Like, Am I ever going to be fully free, right? Is this always just this never-ending process? Uh, I, I want to share some good news about this. This process, this unfolding process of freedom. And there are two things in this truth that I want us to grab a hold of. Because this calls us to compassion and hope. This truth about freedom gives us cause for compassion and hope. You see, because freedom comes from one degree of glory to the next, we can have compassion on those who are still imprisoned in various ways. When we see someone who is caught in addiction or stuck in destructive tendencies, instead of responding with judgment, 
we can respond with compassion. Because this journey to freedom always seems to be two steps forward and one step back, right? When we encounter someone who is imprisoned by anxiety or depression, instead of just expecting them to snap out of it, we can respond with compassion and care. Because healing and freedom take time. These things take time. The truth about freedom unfolding over time is that it calls us to compassionate patience. Compassionate patience. As we pray for those who are on this journey of freedom and show them the same mercy that God has shown us. So it calls us to compassion, but it also calls us to hope. It also calls us to deep, deep hope. This constantly moving picture of freedom will stir up in us, it should stir up in us, a kind of holy dissatisfaction with the way things are. Because our hope is deeper than the way things are right now. Our hope is greater than the way things are right now. The freedom that we are invited into is a constant journey from one degree of glory to another. And this is true no matter our circumstances, right? I mean, it, it's obviously good news that when things are bad, they can get better, right? That's obvious, but it's also good news that when things are good, they can still get better. And yet, that might not be good news for those of us who are comfortable. It might not be good news to those of us who are distracted by golden calves, right? But no matter how comfortable we may be, this truth about freedom stirs us to keep moving. It shows us that, hey, there's, there's always more. And, and I want you to hear this. I really hear this. There is more. There's always more. I mean, I, I think that this is what our church is being invited into in this coming season. We, we can't just look back at how things have been. We can't just be comfortable with our church services or service projects. The gospel calls us into deeper ways of living, into deeper paths of freedom, into deeper life with God and life together. But this freedom means we can't just sit around in Egypt anymore. Right? We have to journey through the wilderness. We have to look to God to guide and to provide. And I believe that this church has been on this journey already for a while. But I just want to say, let's keep going. Let's keep moving. Let's not be satisfied with this degree of glory. Because the journey of the kingdom is from one degree of glory to the next. There's always more freedom to receive. There's always more glory to behold. And so let's keep seeking it. Let's keep pursuing this together. Now, I, I want to say a couple other things about freedom that we see here in this passage. Because so far, we've talked about what it is, right? Freedom is this process that unfolds from one degree to the next. But I also want to consider how this process occurs, and really what it's for, the how and the why. And this is where I think Scripture might really start to challenge us in some of our assumptions. Because you see, today's holiday commemorates the ratification of the Declaration of Independence. But Christian freedom does not come from declaring 
independence. Rather, Christian freedom comes from increasing dependence on God. It does not come from declaring independence for ourselves, but increasing dependence on Jesus. I mean, just look back at the text. In verse 14, Paul uses this image of a veil that we've already talked about as the sign of continued captivity. And at the end of the verse, he writes, only in Christ is it set aside. Then he reiterates it in verse 16. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And again, in verse 17, he says, when, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so we don't find freedom in independence, but rather in dependence on God. We don't journey from one degree of glory to the next by mustering up our own strength and doing it ourselves. Rather, Verse 18 says, it is by seeing the glory of the Lord that we are transformed. You know, I, I've heard it said before that physical maturity and spiritual maturity are the exact inverse of one another. They're completely opposite, right? At the beginning of our physical lives, we are entirely dependent on others entirely dependent on our caregivers for everything, right? They feed us, they bathe us, they clothe us and keep us warm. But as we grow, we become increasingly independent. I mean, every parent celebrates the day their child is finally able to go to the bathroom on their own, right? Yes, <laughs> no more diapers to deal with. Uh, or celebrates when their child can finally dress themselves and get ready on their own. I recently saw on social media, uh, someone said, this is the first year the kids are putting on their own sunscreen, and it's a game changer. Like, life is just completely transformed, right? As we physically grow, we become increasingly independent. But spiritual maturity is completely the opposite. Because at the beginning of our spiritual lives, we're essentially independent. We look to ourselves for the answers. We don't know Christ. We don't rely on God. We don't ask for forgiveness. But as we spiritually mature, we become more aware of our desperate need for God. We increasingly and freely confess our sins and ask for grace. And, and we do learn to walk, but it's not in our own strength. It's in the Spirit. We don't look to ourselves, but to Jesus. As we read Scripture and, and pray and spend time with Him, you see, we become less concerned with ourselves as we behold the glory of God. And this is how we are transformed from one degree of glory to the next. Not by becoming independent, but by increasingly becoming dependent on God. This is why the symbol of Christian life is baptism. Right? It's the sign of death and burial. It's a sign of surrender. And, and, you know, baptism is not something that you can do or accomplish, right? It can only be done to you. You don't baptize yourself. You are baptized. It's something that we receive. It's something that is—we're passive in that moment. It's a sign that our life begins in death as we become utterly dependent on God, on Jesus, to carry and sustain us and give us new life. You see, American freedom came about by declaring independence from a king. 
But Christian freedom comes from increasing dependence on the King, who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's only in Christ that the veil is removed. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so this is how freedom unfolds, increasingly relying on God. But there's one more thing that I want to say. What is freedom for? What is freedom for? Well, you know, Galatians sums it up really simply. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. What does that mean? It means that the freedom is not ultimately for us. It's not for ourselves. Because as we grow in God, we become increasingly less concerned about ourselves and more concerned for others. You see, the the passage that we've read constantly connects this idea of freedom to living in the Spirit, right? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. As we're transformed from one degree of glory to the next, and this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. And, And this reminds me of Jesus. You know, I mean, if freedom is where the Spirit is, then the freest person to ever walk the earth is Jesus Christ. I mean, he is the person who walked in fullness of the Spirit, in perfect union with God the Father, full of the, full of the Spirit, right? Jesus was the freest person to walk the earth. And yet, how did he live? I, I want to read, I have this on the screen, from Luke chapter 4, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He comes to Nazareth, and he reads a, 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 a scripture. When he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he said, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. You see, Jesus was the freest person to ever walk the earth, and he was not remotely concerned with his own freedom. When he came in the fullness of the Spirit, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And as I walk in the Spirit, it's my job to proclaim freedom to others. You see, this freedom is not just for us to grab hold of for ourselves. As we walk in the Spirit, we are called to set others free. And so the question that we have to ask as we follow Jesus is, who's not free yet? Who still needs to be set free? Who is still oppressed? Who is still under some yoke of of burden, some yoke of oppression, right? How can we help others find more freedom? This is what we're called to as God's people, to not only seek freedom for ourselves, but to freely offer freedom to others. I imagine evangelism is simply telling someone, hey, you're free. You're free. All that stuff that you're stuck in, that's, that's on you, you, you don't, you're not bound by that. You're free. And this is precisely where the the evangelism is tied up with the work of justice, right? Because there's so many injustices in the world. Those who are stuck in homelessness or poverty, stuck in addiction, stuck in uh, the sex industry, right? This is one of the things that we're trying to, to work with with the Genesis Project. How can we serve some people who are stuck in this and find freedom for them? 
fight for freedom. And so who is it that needs freedom? And how can we bring that to them? In the name of Jesus, this is what it is to walk in freedom. We grow in it ourselves from one degree of glory to the next, but there's more, right? There was more freedom a hundred years ago to be found. There is more freedom a hundred years from now to be found. Let's keep searching for it. Let's keep bringing it about. This is what it is to walk in the Spirit. So as we come to the table today, I want to share a, a song with you all. It's uh, fairly traditional in the church to, to take uh, things from the culture and kind of reinvent them in light of the gospel. One early example of this uh, is the early church took uh, a sort of national phrase, Caesar is Lord, and they reworked it. They said, no, Jesus is Lord, right? And, and this has happened time and again. That, that would be almost like, instead of saying, I pledge allegiance to the flag of America, saying, I pledge allegiance to the cross of Christ, right? That's the same thing for us, to just rework a, a current thing and say, hey, how, how does this uh, can be shaped in light of the gospel? And this song is another great example of that. Uh, there's a song that many of you may be familiar with, often referred to as the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And it's a great song in and of itself. Uh, it's actually a song about fighting for freedom. But this song has recently been reworked uh, to say, hey, this was good when it was written. The fight for freedom is good. Uh, you know, this was written during the Civil War, I believe. Uh, but ultimately, freedom is not fought with by the tools of war. Freedom is ultimately fought with by the tools of peace. And that's what this song is all about. And so it's, you'll recognize some of the words in the tune, uh, but just receive these words as we pursue freedom and the peace that God offers. Amen. <laughs>